That is okay. Six Golf, our regular Wednesday night webinar. We're happy to have you on board. If you ever want to join us, absolutely free. All you got to do is go to quickfixgolf.com, look for golf lessons, and under that, when you hover over that, you go down the menu and you'll see golf webinars, and they'll have the link, and it's always Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So they changed that crazy thing. And we have as a special guest today, I have with me my, my partner in crime here, Darren Demelli, former teacher of the Bear operation there, Golden Bear, Hello, Jack Nicholas, for seven years. And we have on the line right now also the swing man of golf, Jacob Bowden, who's not only a long drive champion, but he's also a single length golf club guru. And I'm really excited about asking you about this because I did an intense study on this uh, single length thing. So, um, we're going to throw that if that's okay, Jacob. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's uh, it's great to be here with you guys, and hope I can uh, provide some good insight into into those things. Yeah, you're you're at the PGA Championship right now. Yeah, yeah. My parents actually live in St. Louis. I'm from St. Louis, so this was an opportunity to do a little uh, visiting with my parents, and then also. Uh, to do some PGA Championship stuff, so it, it worked out well. You're a good son. Now, so for some of the people that are watching, and you can correct me as we go along here, um, unless you want to step in and, and tell them this, but go ahead. You know, this is a, a typical set of golf clubs. The club head weighs about seven grams different per club, correct? Uh, from what I, yeah, six to eight, yeah, roughly seven, right? Yeah, rough, roughly seven, depending on the set, whatever, and a half an inch difference right. in length. So if yep. you have a five iron, as it shows here, 257 grams is what the head weighs, the shaft would be standard, would be around 38 inches. Uh, it could be longer depending on the fitting or whatever with somebody, but let's just say standard length is 38 inches. So then the next club, which is a six iron, would, a set, would weigh seven grams more in the head and be a half an inch shorter. Right. Your set is, and I, and I, I don't know that your set is this way, but it, it typically 273 grams, at least the sets I've built, uh, they were at 273 grams for the head weight. And you make them all at 37 or 37 and a half inches. Is that correct? Is that somewhere near right? Uh, 36 and a half or 37. So uh, roughly eight iron or seven iron lengths. You mean you go as short as eight iron length? Yeah, well that that's an, there's an interesting reason for that because I've been involved in single length since 2007, and historically single length irons, even if you go all the way back to the Tommy Armour EQLs in the, I guess it was the late 80s, early 90s, uh, right. they're historically been built at five iron, six iron, or seven iron lengths, and when we were doing our research to uh, to to design our set and, and build our set, one of the we had the advantages of the modern day internet so we could look at comments and feedback and i had my personal experience as well from from playing them as a professional and then also uh, selling them for a number of years as well and one of the things that people did not like was having such a long length club around the greens um so you know when you're chipping you have a five iron length or six iron length or seven iron length club and it just felt too long for too many people so uh, when Tom Wachon and I went to the drawing board to design these things, and uh, that was one of the things that we wanted to solve in our set uh, that I believe gives us an advantage because not only does it give you a shorter length club around the green, but then when you look at your ball striking over the course of the year, uh, we have a ball striking advantage because, you know, over thousands of hits, you could argue that an eight iron length club is going to be easier to strike in the center more consistently than a five, six, or seven iron length. So uh, that was one of the reasons why we went all the way down to eight iron length. Well, that's something Darren and I were talking about today. I'm a big center to a hit creep, and I believe you got to hit the ball in the center of the golf club. And we were talking about how the long irons, and we're going to ask you that question in a second, having difficulty to get the, the launch angle that you're looking for. However, you do have the advantage that you you got a better shot at hitting the center of gravity of the golf club. Right, right, yeah. So when that's true, when you go for a, a shorter length club, and when you, uh, as you get used to playing single length, and you're making the same swing with every club, you 
you can really dial in your uh, striking. So um, that was how one of the problems historically with single length is that there would be a little bit of distance loss with, say, the four, five, six, and seven irons. So uh, part of that you get back from just better striking, but then also uh, uh, my uh, partner in this, Tom Wishon, he was smart enough to use a different uh, metal type. Um, um, uh, he's really good with the metallurgy. And he used a high COR uh, springy face so that we could get uh, not only the ball speeds back up, but then the launch angles as well. So that was one of the things that we wanted to solve with this particular set was the those uh, lower lofted clubs, uh, the quote unquote long uh, long irons. They needed to go the heights and distances that you would expect for those clubs, but at eight iron length. Yeah, I mentioned that to Darren today from all the reading I did, which I read up on you. I didn't know who you were at the time. Um, because I was I was doing on my blog and everything a complete study because I was interested in it, and, uh, and I've been a club builder for a long time. So I said, you know, this would be fun to sort of try and find out the real truth about this thing. And I read about how you change something about the face in order to get the ball speed up so that you could get the uh, the four and five iron up in the air. Um, we 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 changed the uh, the the metal type uh, from. Uh, the uh, irons lower than the the eight iron, and then we used a softer metal for the ones above the eight iron. And then you also mentioned you were talking about strike and how strike is important to you as a club player. Um, and I think one of the things that also gives us an advantage uh, with our set is that um, Tom Wilson, as you know, he caters an, uh, to custom club fitting. I'm a big fan of custom club fitting, so we can bend the loft angles and the lie angles for uh, plus or minus four degrees. Uh, we, we say three degrees, but a, a good uh, fitter might be able to get four out of them. And then we have a hidden uh, weight bore in the hosel that allows us to adjust the build to different lengths, different MOIs, different swing weights, and um, really fit the club to the golfer, which – uh, helps, of course, helps uh, ball striking. So why why did you go to single length? What prompted you to do that? Well, in 2003, I was a 27 year old, 14 handicapper, and I had about 40 grand saved up, and I I was dissatisfied with my corporate job, and I I was always into sports and an athlete, and I had a tryout with the Twins for baseball, played basketball in college, and. I still felt like I wanted to be involved in sports, so I thought, you know, if I take a, take a year off, uh, take my 40 grand in savings and just play golf for a year, how how good could I get? So I covered, covered a lot of ground, and I uh, cashed my first check later that year and started making some cuts, shot some uh, – really just improved my game. I got good enough to turn pro. And then I was looking for – since I had such a late start in uh, golf relative to a lot of other uh, top players, I felt like I needed to do something different um, to, in a way to innovate, to, to gain an advantage so that I could make up for the, uh, make up some ground. No. And, and um, so I was just sitting there. Uh, I forget how I, I thought of it, but I was just like, you know what? Why aren't the irons all the same length? It would, it would seem like it, things would be a lot more consistent if they were the same weight and same length, and you could just really groove a swing. So I started looking around on the internet in 2007, and I found a company uh, that was making them at the time, and I ordered myself a set. And uh, it felt a little weird at first to get used to longer length wedges and shorter length, say four and five irons. But after a few weeks, I started getting used to it, and then within a a couple months, I shot my uh, first round tournament round in the 60s in a, in a pro event, and I was like, "Man, I'm sold on these single length irons. This is just this is just gold here." <laughs> huh. Still there? Yeah, we're still here. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. So okay. <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the concerns we've had is um, with the single length, at least in my 
experiences, Jake, with the lower lofted clubs. And obviously a better player can get those lower lofted clubs up into the air because they can create some speed. But, you know, for the average person who comes through um, th through our um, facilities, uh, what um, what are your thoughts with a lower um, swing speed and the single length? Well, w w if you're dealing with single length or conventional irons, um, lower club head speed is going to mean, you know, lower ball speeds, lower launch angles. And at some point, someone's going to have to transition from an iron to a hybrid to a fairway wood. So uh, that exists whether you're dealing with single length irons or conventional irons. And um, how we do it with the Sterling irons, we uh, – I, I don't remember the, the guidelines off the top of my head, but um, pretty well everyone can handle six iron and up. Um, so depending on how far, uh, how your club head speed is, how uh, fast you swing, how far you hit the ball, then uh, some people can handle the five iron. And then typically only higher swing speed players that are, that are pushing uh, tour, tour level swing speeds can handle uh, our four iron, which is 19 degrees. So, and that's, I mean, you'd, you'd see that as well in regular irons. If you take a 19 degree iron, uh, there's only going to, you need club head speed to be able to hit it. So um, that's something that just exists uh, single length or conventional irons. So yeah. we'll, 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 based on, based on the person, we'll recommend, we'll say only go up to this iron. And then above that, you know, you can start fitting the rest of your bag with a, a hybrid or a fairway wood or something like that to, to fill out the rest of your set. So, you know, the average golfer is under the impression that, you know, between irons, there's about a 10 yard difference. Obviously, we know there's some give or take there. What about the single length iron there? Are you seeing 10 yard differences on average? What, what kind of um, uh, differences in, in yardage are you seeing there? That that historically was a problem as well. So most of the distance from clubs comes from the, the loft. And then you get a little bit from the length. So when you start uh, going to single lengths, if you were to just take a, you know, a regular set of clubs and try and tack them down and make them all be the single length, at those lofts of traditional conventional length irons, there's going to be a little bit of distance bunching. And that was one of the things that we observed in the uh, single length market when we decided, when we were looking like, okay, we, this is something we need to solve. Um, if you're a higher swing speed player, you could still have sufficient gaps, but the 90% of the market that's buying the irons, um, it, there would be a little bit of bunching. So uh, part of how we solved that was just, we pushed our lofts uh, to five degrees. Uh, well, we go from 60, 55 to 50, 45, 40, 35, and then we go to four, uh, four degrees, 31, 27, 23, 19. So we push the, the loss uh, of the clubs out a little bit more so that you would, the, the, the average everyday golfer um, is going to get their expected uh, distance gotcha. gap. So what I did with a set I built for some folks, Jacob, is I, I made the five iron a half inch longer than the six iron. And then I drilled seven grams out of the head. And then I made the six, seven, and eight all the same length. And then the nine iron was a half inch shorter, and I added seven grams right, in the cavity. And then the pitching wedge was an inch shorter, and I put 14 grams in that cavity. So it sort of went straight from six, seven, eight up to the five and down on the nine and, and pitching wedge. That's way did, did that work out pretty well for <laughs> uh, when you uh, built it like that? Uh, no, it worked out pretty well, I thought, but uh, um, probably not to the uh, to the extent to what you. I mean, you guys went, you know, with, with with all the metal changes. I mean, come on. I mean, that's that's the real thing. I was just <laughs> doing it as a club builder, buying heads, you know, that I could put together and put a shaft in it and, and try and help out. Yeah, it, the average it, guy that might, you know. It's so, such a challenge uh, to try and turn 
uh, a conventional set of heads into a single length head or single length set that works. I, well, I mean, you'll, you'll, you can get the, the lengths the same and you can play around with the weight, shave off some weight, add some weight. Um, but you still might get a little bit of distance punching. I guess you could change, you could bend the lofts a little bit. So yeah, when we were doing this, we just, we, we, looked at what are all what's all the good and then what's are all the historic problems and how do we fix that from a design standpoint so that you can just these are designed to be single length they're not they're not uh they're designed to fix all those things basically now what about the dechambeau we just put on the screen here if you can see it uh with this like 13 degree upright golf club um you didn't go real upright, did you? No, we're we're uh, eight iron length. We're basically about the same as what uh, any other eight iron um, that you see out on the market. That that's something that we've bumped into a little bit uh, with Bryson playing single length and him being probably the most popular player playing single length, and him having a unique swing and just being a unique personality and having such upright clubs that people think like, oh, to play single length, I have to do that to my clubs. I have to swing a certain way. And the reality is like the way we built it, Bryson has uh, his clubs specially made for him. So I think uh, I'd have to look back at the specs on the Cobras, but I think just the specs that you, uh, that you can get with the Cobras off the off the rack and stuff. Those are going to be like a normal set of golf clubs as well. So uh, Bryson's just a unique case, um, and uh, t to get him that much, the line goes that upright. He would have to have, you know, I mean, if they're paying him a lot of money, what's you know, spending ten grand <laughs> to to get a set of tools that build a set of clubs specifically for him it's it's worth it for them to do that mike sent in a question here saying that he wanted to know if the hybrids are they the same length as the irons we do a, a five iron hybrid and the five is a 20 uh, 23 degrees mm -hmm. so for someone that gets a little bit lower on the swing speed or maybe they uh they or tend to be a low ball hitter. Uh, in some cases like that, we might recommend the five hybrid instead of the five iron. And the main thing with that is, is with a hybrid, and the same thing with a fairway wood. You can move the set, the you move the center of gravity back a little bit, so it helps get the ball up more. So uh, there is a five with the Sterling irons in particular. We do have a five hybrid. Uh, we built a four iron hybrid but we there's only two prototypes and we we haven't actually um uh, got those for sale it, it's it's just so few people i guess that would actually use that, that that at least for this starting out we thought like let's just do the five hybrid and then we'll have the four hybrid on hold if we ever decide that you know we want to move forward with that well let's ask you a little bit about speed Oh, the meat and potatoes. Yay. Everybody wants to hit home runs. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> so this is this is where I really um, w was introduced to, to Jacob. I was uh, intrigued with um, with hitting the ball a little bit farther, and I really didn't know anything about speed training and, and how to swing the club faster. And a good friend of mine who works for Michael Breed, Bob Aginette, uh had given me Jacob's information. Um, and it's definitely a passion of yours, Jacob, um, being that you competed for so many years uh, hitting the long ball. But what what are some of the elements that, that go into swinging the golf club faster? With swing speed training, it's uh, – it, the swing speed training that I do is all body work. So distance is going to come down to – you know, hit, uh, having a decent swing that you can uh, hit the ball in the center of the club face. Um, so a good strike, a good technique, and then get your equipment fit to you so that you're optimizing your launch angle and your uh, uh, spin rates and, and landing angle and all that. And then beyond that, 
this is the dilemma that I was in when I first started getting into this stuff. When I was competing in long drive, the world, world long drive championships back in 2003, 2006, and 2007. And I was like, you know what? I got my swing pretty good here, and I got my equipment fit for as, about as well as we knew how to do back then. So it's like, man, the only way I can think of to, to hit longer is to train my body to swing faster. And I knew from my sports background, um, you know, again, I played, I had a really high vertical leap in basketball. I played basketball in college. I was, uh, baseball, uh, had a tryout with the twins at the Metrodome. I did some, uh, fitness modeling in my mid twenties. So I was doing fitness magazine. So I knew a lot about strength building and bodybuilding and that kind of stuff. And I thought I looked on the internet. This was back in 2006, six ish. And they're really at that time of the, uh, at that age of the internet, you know, this was prior to YouTube, prior to social media type stuff. And there was really no information out there in the golf industry about how to physically train to be able to swing faster. But yet I knew this could, could happen from other sports. So I pulled my, my own personal sports uh, experience and then I researched other sports. So uh, Dr. Fred Hatfield, um, he, they call they nickname him, nickname him Dr. Squat. He was a, a record holding power lifter had over a 40 inch vertically. I uh, looked at Bruce Lee for his, uh, what he did to train his body to, to move fast. And I just pulled, looked at, looked at all the other sports, all the other disciplines and gobbled together everything I could think of to make my body go faster. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to try all these things and put it together in a program for golf specifically. And in 37 days, 36, 37 days, I think it was, I went up 24 miles an hour, which is unheard of. It's, I mean, it's a huge, huge increase. So of course people were like, whoa, geez, how, how are you doing that? Like, how do you get to be swinging so fast all of a sudden? Um, and enough people asked me that, that I was like, you know, maybe uh, there's something here that, that uh, uh, would work for other people. I'm so, busy. I was like, you know, <laughs> you, you know, a lot, a lot of people aren't going to want to do the extent of the training that I did. So I was like, let's pull the bare bones of this, of what seemed to be the most important things. And I'll put together a very basic program that the weekend golfer could do. I'll test it on five of my friends that are different ages, different handicaps. And if they can get over 10 miles an hour, all of them in a month, then this is worth pursuing. And so we did that. And sure enough, all of them got 12 to 16 miles an hour, which translates to 30 or 40 yards. It's just a big, big increase. And uh, I was like, well, I guess I got to do something. So that was the the beginnings. Uh, that was in 2007. I was doing that testing. That was the beginnings of uh, my my foray into uh, uh, being a swing speed trainer, I guess you could call it. And then now in the last uh, last couple of years, you know, we built up a lot of testimonials. I, I worked with a lot, a lot of amateurs. I worked with, uh, I was living over at Europe at the time. So I worked with some European tour guys, some senior tour guys, uh, Asian tour guys. And it was just getting really, really great results. Um, and Darren, you mentioned uh, uh, Michael Breed. When my wife and I moved back to the States, we moved to New York. And I tested, uh, Michael wanted me to uh, put to work some of the swing speed training on his pros, Bob, uh, your friend, and then uh, one of the other pros there. And uh, let's see, I think if I remember right, Bob, in a couple months, he went up, I'd have to look up his stats, but I think he went up 18 miles an hour. And he was just, over the over the moon happy because he felt like he uh was able to resurrect his career um, i forget how old bob is maybe mid 40s or so so he was losing a bit of distance and just wasn't as competitive in the his, the pro events that he was playing in and all of a sudden he was competitive he felt like he was competitive again and so it was just a you know it's just a fantastic thing um that, that's kind of sort of stumbled onto in a way <laughs> I, I didn't intend to like you know pursue this this type of uh this specific area of the golf industry but 
as it happened, it just kind of worked out that way. So there, Jacob. No. Can hear. Is there? Yep, can you, I can hear you. Okay, we just had some background noise here from the next one. Did you, do you sell a book or, or, or a program or something where somebody can actually get these these, these things that you do? Yeah, for Club at Speed? Yeah, for the, the everyday golfer, or for any golfer really, um, I created a website, swingmangolf.com. Okay. Uh, we sell uh, access to the knowledge and information on how to do that. And then for teaching professionals, we just started a certification program last year that teaches uh, teaching pros how, all the ins and outs and of how to do this and how to train people to uh, to do this at their own facilities and with their own uh, their own their own golfers. Cool. I, I want to say I was the first certified. Is that right? I believe so, yeah. There we go. <laughs> now he's <laughs> and then you've had some success too with your students, right, Darren? Like you've had you know, uh, I, I, a number I, of uh, students. I give you credit all the time. You know, some of the <laughs> techniques and ideas that um, that you've shared with me and, and through the certification process, I've had really good success. Um, it, it works. There's nothing else really to say about it. The, the program works and it doesn't take a lot. You know, I've been successful with the isometric training of it, um, the, the lightweight training of it, just getting people into tune to swinging faster. Right. So if you're swinging mm -hmm. a golf club that's extremely light, you can move it faster. And, and there's elements of your body that respond, um, i.e. the fast twitch muscles um, that that you want to train there. Um, so a lot of the elements that um, that I've learned from you, I've had huge success with huge success. There, there's two main components with the swing speed training. Uh, one is. It sounds simple, <laughs> well, it is simple, but it's just practicing swinging fast. So virtually no one outside of uh, long drive guys, professional long drivers are actually making a concerted effort to try to get their body to swing faster and train themselves to do it while under, uh, while still maintaining balance, being under control. So that's just the first part. So if you just, you know, a couple times a week, uh, get a little swing speed radar and just practice swinging as fast as you can in control, uh, maybe 30 reps or so, not rapid firing. So make a, kind of like how you're hitting balls on the range, just make a swing, pause, rest for a second, make another swing. And then if you, the, the so that's the first component. And then the second main component is increasing the strength of your golf swing and most importantly your the muscles that you use in the downswing so darren you mentioned those isometrics uh where that originated from i picked up the isometric training from that was a big part of bruce lee's training he he did a lot of isometrics to get uh work on his fast twitch uh muscles and to get uh, really strong for, for low reps, really explosive, really powerful. So if you do some uh, band, some isometrics with some resistance bands in different positions with your right hand and left hand and both hands through your downswing motion over the course of the month, if you keep adding a little bit of resistance each time, you can make your downswing muscles quite a bit stronger. So because virtually no one is doing anything for their speed or the strength of their golf swing, just doing those two simple things there oftentimes is, is enough to get people over 10 miles an hour in a month, which is huge. I mean, people pay a lot of money for the latest driver and instruction and all that stuff. So uh, just a simple thing like that 
uh, you know, can get you that 25, 30, 40 yards that you've been looking for. I've heard you say something twice. Make your body swing faster. Uh, say that again? I heard you say twice, make your body swing faster. Do you, you swing the golf mm-hmm. club with your body or with your arms? Uh, it, I would say it's individualized and that's what, so when you practice swinging fast, you're practicing swinging fast using your own swing. So whatever you feel or whatever your, your, you feel like your drivers are in the swing, that's what you would do. And then similarly with the, the downswing band isometrics, you can position yourself such that you're strengthening up, uh, various components of your swing in the way that you swing and in the positions that you swing. So it's, that's what really uh, makes a difference too, is it's uh, those two things you can really personalize to the individual and how they swing. And it doesn't have to, you know, be a certain thing like uh, for pushers or pullers or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to fill in the blank, I guess. And uh, Eduardo just asked you, in fact, he's on from Brazil, believe it or not. Um, he, he said, how much does the right hand have to do with distance? Uh, well, it has some to do with distance, for sure. Uh, you're, everyone that's a two-handed golfer is using both hands and using their right hand. Um, I think it depends. Some people would probably use their right hand more. Some people would probably use their left hand more, and and they would focus on that. Uh, I don't know that there's – even if – we'll say you focus on your left hand, you're still using your right hand some, even though you're focusing on your left hand. And same thing with your right hand. So I I don't know that the right hand necessarily is any particular secret to it. Some people – use that as what they what they uh, focus on and and uh you know like throwing say you're a right-handed golfer if you're uh skipping rocks sidearm that's a very uh, uh right-handed type uh, feel um or maybe if you're a left-handed person and you feel like you're pulling on a rope or slinging a frisbee or something um so it just depends on the person i think all right, let's look at uh, – let's see if we had another question here. Where to go? Why are the golf pros today hitting the ball further? Or are they? Or are they, yeah. Uh, well, the distance stats on the PGA Tour go back to, what, 1980? And there is a definite increase since 1980, and part of that is moving – is the, the graphite shafts, I think, so the – Club heads are lighter, so they can be swung faster. Uh, club heads are a little bit longer now as well, so you get a little bit more speed from the longer club. And then he, we got away from, you know, the old persimmon woods. So the heads are the – I think the COR of persimmon is 0.78, and now the USGA has a 0.83 uh, limit on the heads, the springiness of the heads. So – Virtually all the heads made today, driver heads made today, are going to go up and push that 830 barrier. So part of it is the the, comp- the components there. Um, and the ball, uh, you can see that made a difference around two, I forget the year it was, 2000, 2001, when the Pro V1 came out. And uh, so I think the ball did make a little bit of difference. It's hard to say. Uh, I would imagine guys are a little bit more fit and are swinging faster um, just from a fitness standpoint. It, it's hard to verify, though, because the swing speed stats only go back to 2007, I think, uh, the club head speed stats. So it's it, you kind of just have to guess a little bit on that. And then also trying to isolate is the distance from the ball – or is it from the club, or is it from the actual fitness of the person? Um, I think the quality of the ball striking is probably, you know, tour players back then hit the center, the sweet spot pretty consistently, and that's the same too. So I, I don't think it's a matter of that. Uh, I, I would say it's a it's a combination of things. 
What do you think about the idea, you being a long ball hitter yourself, what do you think about the idea of shorter, more strategic golf courses with a limited flight golf ball? Uh, I'm okay with it, personally. Um, I, 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 you know, my original foray into golf was to be a golfer, and, and I'm, it, when people know me in person, they, you know, I'm pretty laid back and casual and even when I, you know, when I talk in videos and stuff, I, I don't, I'm not the most uh, super enthusiastic person, I guess. And, and I like nature. And um, so re regular golf and just, I don't know, the, those type of aspects about it appeal to me. So I like playing pitch and putt courses and executive courses just as much as full tour length courses. So for me, I don't, I don't care if they, they take some distance off the ball and, and go to uh, shorter courses. Uh, that's that's fine for me. Well, I'll tell you what, this has been a real pleasure. We really learned a lot. Let's see, well, how do we go back to the beginning? Well, as a matter, I wanted to go back and see this picture. Is there anything else you'd like to add to us? Uh, well, uh, let's see, we talked about uh, is there anything you want to know about long drives, like the sport of long drive, or do you want to know anything about the sport of speed golf? Um, I've been involved in, in, I've involved in both of those sports. I finished fifth in the speed golf world championships and I won the pinnacle distance challenge and some qualifiers for the, the world long drive championships. So I, I, I can, and I've interviewed a lot of the guys. I've talked to Jamie Solowski, Jason Zubak. I, I know a lot of the guys. So, is there anything anyone wants to know about long drive or speed golf? What I'd like to do is show you a site here, swingman.com. Oh, yeah. So website, swingmangolf.com is where you can swingman. find all the swing speed training stuff. Swingman. And then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> swingman. Swing, swing golf, man. <laughs> swing golf. And, swingman golf. And then uh, the single length irons, if you want to check those out, that's sterlingirons.com. And then. Do you sell the uh, the components to somebody like us where we can put them together, or is it strictly full length already built from the manufacturer? Uh, presently, we sell direct to consumer through the website. And then uh, my uh, Tom Wachon, we, we have some of his club fitters that we give the, uh, that we let purchase the heads. Tom is about to retire, so when he retires, that's going to change. Sterling Irons is just going to become its own uh, brand, and standalone brand, and uh, that is one of the things that we're going to be doing is definitely, uh, you know, we want people to be able to demo the clubs. A lot of people haven't tried single length, and a lot of people just want to hit clubs anyway before they hit them single length or not. So uh, we do want to... And the clubs perform better um, from a custom fitting standpoint as well. That, that goes for any club. So we do definitely want uh, – currently you can get them through Wachon Golf. Very soon that's only – that's going to go away, and it's just uh, – we'll set something up that uh, club fitters can go uh, through sterlingirons.com, the, the main website. For that. Jacob, before we close here, can you just tell us a little bit about your experience with Mike Austin and, and tell our audience who Mike Austin is in case they don't? Oh, know. right. I totally, <laughs> I totally forgot now. about that. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's another thing. Uh, Mike Austin. So who is Mike Austin? Mike Austin is credited by Guinness Records as the guy who hit the longest drive in a, in a tournament and in 1974 so this was back in the back in the day with the old uh steel shaft or simon wood uh ball blotta ball 43 and a half inch shaft or 43 and a half inch club he hit a 515 yard drive in the u.s national senior open in las vegas and he did it which is even crazier when he was 64 years old and I remember as a kid, uh, I was born in 1976. So uh, I'm, when, when I was growing up in the 80s, uh, I, you know, I was a big sports guy and I had a, 
a, a book, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records, and I remember paging through there, and I remember specifically that record, and I'm like, how in the world can someone hit it that far? That that, that just doesn't seem possible. And um, lo and behold, when I started pursuing my golf career when I was 27, I moved out. I'm from St. Louis, and I moved out to California, and. Uh, one day I was hitting balls on the range and it was just super, super windy. And, um, you know, I was, I was just trying to, trying to get good. I was out there grinding and there was one guy out there with me. He was an old, uh, uh, construction, uh, uh, he, uh, construction guy. He built, uh, movie sets and TV sets in, in Hollywood in Los Angeles. I don't know if you remember little house on the prairie. He built the sets on, on that show and, so anyway, he he had retired and was out uh, golfing, and he was interested in pursuing a career on the senior tour. And uh, there was one swing where I made where the wind was – the gust of wind was so strong, it blew us both over. And I would have ran into him if it didn't – if he uh, if the wind hadn't knocked him over too. And we both kind of commented on our uh, – on our uh, – uh, manliness, I guess, for practicing in those conditions. And we just started talking and I told him I was out there pursuing a golf career. And, uh, he was like, Oh, wow, that's cool. Well, Hey, uh, have you heard of Mike Austin? And I'm like, uh, the name sounds familiar. And, uh, he said, uh, well, Mike Austin is this guy who hit this long drive, 515 yards, whatever. And he's one of my friends. He lives right, uh, right down the road. Do you want to go meet him and hang out with him? And, and uh and maybe get some tips from her and i'm like sure <laughs> and then as we were driving over i remembered like oh wow this is amazing this is the guy i read about in the book when i was a kid <laughs> so i was just you know kid in the candy store excited to go over there and meet mike austin and uh this was only a few weeks after i had moved out to california so um for whatever reason and the, those guys, Dan Shogger and Mike Austin, they took a liking to me, and and I couldn't afford lessons because I was trying to stretch that forty grand out as long as I could. And they said, uh, you know, we're willing, we're going to take you under our wing. And and I started. Uh, so so the swing that Dan taught me was was Mike's, uh, what Mike taught and what Mike's swing was. And uh, this was in. Uh, Gosh, I have the stats written down, but starting out, I was just an average length hitter. I was, you know, hitting put into the 225 mark on the driving range. I was, I was ha super happy with that. And then uh, by July, six months later, I hit a 381 yard drive to win the Pinnacle Distance Challenge. So um, the uh, getting the opportunity to to be taken under the wing of Mike and, and learn how he swung. And his swing is a little bit different. Uh, and he was kind of a brash guy. He was, he was uh, not the most tactful person. So I think he kind of kind of pissed a lot of people off trying to say like, oh, my method is better than yours. <laughs> so a lot of people didn't listen to him, even though he is like way longer. But he, uh, he had a more old style swing, kind of like Sam Snead little bit longer backswing. He used his hands a lot more rather than trying to, to hold off your release and compress the ball. He really uh, used his hands to hit at the ball uh, or allowed his hands to, to in the club head to swing through freely. And then he used his legs a lot more, um, kind of like the, the older style versus, you know, modern day golf where we're, we, we – stand with a wide stance don't and keep our knees bent and just get a really solid base athletic stance and just turn around our spine. And, uh, he didn't, he didn't swing like that. He, uh, Oh gosh, it's hard to explain without, without some video or some pictures, but he found a way to leverage, use his legs. Let me back this up. He found a way to use his spine to leverage the power of his legs up and out to the golf club. So when you see video of him swinging, it doesn't look like he swing that fast. And he looks like a nice fluid swing. But, man, when you uh, could see him hit, he would just – I mean, it would just 
the ball coming off the club was like a rocket. And uh, uh, I remember Dan said, Dan used to caddy for Mike, and, and in one of the the pro tournaments that he played in, he and these were against other other pros. Uh, Mike hit on a par five, driver and seven iron, and the other two guys in his group hit driver three wood, seven iron. So Mike was just a really, really long hitter. Um, and I was, I was fortunate to get my, uh, the start to my career off by uh, having him be a mentor of sorts. And I was, uh, I guess in a position mentally where I was willing to, uh, put up with, I mean, he would yell at you. He would smack you. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Like, I mean, he would, he would imagine a teacher like hitting you, like really hitting you hard. I'm like, geez. <laughs> so, but you know, it got your attention. So if you weren't doing what he wanted you to, and then he just oh, smacked your hand real hard. I'm like, Oh geez. Like uh, I got to, I got to do it right here. <laughs> so I, I guess it had, it, it had a nice effect, but, uh, um, so I was, I was in a position also, you know, I was trying to, I was an older golfer, uh, relative to my, my peers that were where I was trying to get to. So I was looking for advantages. I was open to doing things differently and what he was teaching was very different. Um, and I was just open-minded to it and, uh, and I was, I was kind of lucky. And then, uh, uh, there was a book being written uh by phil reed called in search of the greatest golf swing this was back in 2003 i think uh, right when i was starting and uh, uh i started to get a little reputation as like the the living mike austin swing because mike at the time was right. early 90s he had he had had a stroke and and i was hitting the ball far around la and and then so there's a chapter <laughs> It was kind of cool, you know, this Midwestern kid, me going out to L.A. and then getting a, a chapter featured about me in that book. And uh, it was called The Living Austin Swing. So, and, and we were similar in height and weight, like we were both. So I, I think that's part of it. Mike was 6'2 and 215. So he was a big guy. And that's, that's you know, I'm, that's, I'm the same height and weight. So I think part of it came down to, uh, you know, he was just strong and could, and athletic and can swing fast but uh he did a lot of unique things from a tech uh, technical standpoint as well that were definitely not being taught at the time so i was very much going against the grain of what the then uh golf industry was uh teaching so well, that's a little bit about mike austin yeah he's, <laughs> i know he was he was very influential and and um in your life and and uh, you shared a lot of what he did with you with me so um, I'm very grateful and we're very grateful that uh, you were able to spend uh, you know close to an hour with us here on our webinar yeah, you know if, if someone is interested in learning about the Mike Austin swing now that you mentioned it uh, on Swingman Golf the Austin the state uh, granted me access to all his old teaching videos so we we have those videos available to watch uh, as part of Swingman Golf. And then uh, in 2014, I also made my own uh, instructional video teaching the Austin Swing based on my own personal experience with him um, and, and watching all the videos and just kind of being a part of that. I, I don't uh, necessarily subscribe to like, you know, it being the best swing but uh, I'm I'm kind of more of the opinion, I guess, that we all have our own best, uh, unique best swings. And and uh, but if there, I understand that there are people that like to learn methods. And if you are interested in Mike Austin and learning about his uh, swing from for whatever reason, um, you know, th th we those videos are certainly there and available to to watch if you want to do that. Well, I don't know where to go, which is exactly at uh, swingman.com. Swingman.com. Swingman swingman golf. Swingman golf. Swingman. Where's the swing? Where's the swing, ladies? 
Swing lady with a winter swing man. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You, you know, I'll tell you a, a quick little story about where swingman golf came from. It, uh, I, I was, uh, you know, so basketball was one of my first loves. And, and uh, when I was playing in college uh, from 93 to 97 or 98, this was when the Bulls were really good. So I was like a, a big Michael Jordan fan and I lived in St. Louis and we didn't have an NBA team. So Chicago was pretty close for us. So I was always a, a big Bulls and Jordan fan and Jordan, his little, uh, his little logo where his legs are spread apart and he's palming the ball and going up for a dunk. That's the, the uh, jump man. So I was kind of thinking, trying to come up with names and I was like, jump man, like, hmm. Well, how could I make that golf? Oh, swingman. So that's where swingman swingman golf came from. Was it was originated from uh, uh, getting an idea of just seeing the the old Jumpman logo from of Michael Jordan. Well, I encourage everyone um, who was listening today to check out your information. You have a, a tremendous uh, amount of uh, videos on YouTube as well. Um, I was trying to add up all your um views it's probably close to five million if my math works maybe i'm maybe i'm off with that but um check out all your stuff um and and that mike austin um uh library is is really good as well so i, I would encourage everyone to check it out but thanks if people for want a central if people want a central place to find things, uh, they can just go to my personal website, jacobbowden.com, and it's a Jacob with double A, J A A C O B. And th from there, you can branch out and find the YouTube stuff and the Mike Austin stuff and Swingman Golf and Sterling Irons and all that stuff. So, well, we certainly appreciate your time, Jacob, and um, enjoy the PGA Championship. Yeah, and, thanks um, for having me, guys. I really appreciate the. Uh, you know, getting the chance to talk to you and then uh, coming and sharing my, my thoughts and opinions. And I, I'm, I'm glad that there's people out there that are interested in what I have to say and what I've learned and my experiences and stuff. So thank you very much. Of, you're way ahead of me because nobody has any interest whatsoever in what I have to say. Oh, man. And I don't blame you. Nobody has, nobody has interest in what? In anything I have to say. Oh, <laughs> Well, they're here now. They're, we're all listening to you, so. Well, it was a real pleasure, and and uh, we're gonna look into your irons. I promise. Ah, uh, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it, and um, yeah, thank you so much. Go spend some time thank with you. mom and dad. <laughs> Thank you all.